sharing, iya tokbe. They say the elder who soils the floor with shit immediately forgets, but the stench remains in the memory of the person who has to scrape it up. Some people are born to shit, and some, like me and Bolanle, are born to scrape. Bolanle should have known how much her arrival would change our household. I remember the very day she set her foot in this house because it was our sharing night, the night Yasegi distributed the week's provisions. That evening, our mother of the home was quiet. The stone in her throat moved up and down like beads on a dancer's hip. Ihafemi's head was hot. She wanted the blood of this new wife, who had taken her place as the newest, youngest, freshest wife. My only worry was that Bolanle's arrival would disrupt the sex rotation. Papa Segi normally went from wife to wife, starting each week with Iya Segi. By Thursday, he'd start the cycle again, leaving him with the freedom to choose whom to spend Sunday night with. Papa Segi used this night to reward whichever wife had missed a night because of her menstrual flow. Sometimes a wife would have Sunday night if he knew he'd been heavy-handed in scolding her. Most weeks, Iyafemi got Sunday because she enticed him with her granite stew, her ekuru with shrimp sauce, her yam balls, her asun. Baba Segi's belly could not resist her. A more discerning husband would have been even-handed with his Sundays. Now that a new wife had joined us, one of us would have only one night a week. Perhaps Iyasegi had many thoughts because she knew this mantle would fall on her. She was the eldest. She'd had him for 15 years and was approaching the age when enticing your husband to your bedchamber was unnatural. It wouldn't matter to her that she already owned his mind and did with it as she pleased. Some women just wanted everything. We all sat around the dining table until Iafemi made us leap by slapping the wooden surface. Her hands had a horrible yellow glow and her knuckles looked as if they had been scuffed with stone. I don't understand why human beings are not satisfied with the color the gods have given them. A gold bracelet rested on the back of her hand. She wanted Yasegi and me to see it, so we looked away. Is it that our food wasn't tasty enough? Why would Baba Segi marry another wife? Has he condemned our breasts because they are losing their fists? Iyafemi asked. Iyasegi clawed at the jar of Gaga's pomade and shook a dollop into each of three containers. Please, Iyasegi, I pleaded. My daughters cannot sleep for dandruff. They scratch like lice-ridden dogs all night. Can you not spare me one more scoop? Who cares about your daughters? Do you hear me complain when Iyasegi takes more milk for her children, when mine are younger and need vitamins? Iyafemi rolled her eyes and jerked her head in Iyasegi's direction. At first, the older wife ignored her brazenness and continued to rummage through a tin of Bonvita in search of the token that would earn her son a free Nigeria football kit. When her fingers reappeared, they were coated in brown granules. Iyafemi, you are in the habit of saying things that are too big for that little mouth of yours. If you are not satisfied with the way I share provisions, take your ingratitude to another man's house. <laughs> Mind you, make sure you are the first wife and not a lowly third. <laughs> she tucked the token into her bra. Who can tell what the future holds? Iyafemi retorted. At this, the older wife burst into noiseless laughter and hummed as she closed her mouth. <laughs> I reminded them that Baba Segi would take care of all of us, but my words may as well have been the bleating of a goat. The clock in the kitchen struck ten. Not to tell a lie, it seemed strange that the woman Baba Segi was lying with was not one of us. I will not be cast aside because she is a graduate. Iyafemi folded her arms over her bosom. I do not want her in this house. You will trip over in your haste if you are not careful, woman. Your mouth discharges words like diarrhea. Let Bolanle draw on every skill she learnt in her university. <laughs> Let her employ every sparkle of youth. Let her use her fistful breasts. Listen to me. This is not a world she knows. When she doesn't find what she came looking for, she will go back to wherever she came from. Iyasegi pointed to the door. Iyasegi, your words are like proverbs, I said. Let me ask you this. What does our husband value more than what fills his mouth? Iyafemi's eyes widened. Children! Ha! Wisdom at last, Iyasegi said. When Bolanle fails to give him a child, Iyasegi will throw her out. <laughs> we know she will not give him children. So, we should watch from a distance. I don't want to see anyone scratching her doorframe with their toenails. 
both women turned to stare at me. The next morning, Bolande came out of her bedroom. The kitchen fell silent as soon as she cast a shadow on the doorframe. She said good morning and winced as she curtsied. Hey, your legs resemble those of a collapsible chair. <laughs> Yafemi pointed at Bolanle's knees and laughed out loud. You didn't expect to get that sort of thigh thumping, did you? <laughs> she made her voice hoarse. Tell me, does your back ache? Careful, Yafemi. Baba Segi has not left the house yet. <laughs> Yafemi couldn't suppress the pleasure she derived from taunting. The poor woman looked like she would faint with shame. So I offered a bowl of beans. I just cooked them this morning, I said. Bolanle looked at the bowl and said she wasn't hungry. She took a plastic cup from the drainer and filled it with drinkable water from a plastic kettle. I didn't blame her. After a night with Baba Segi, the stomach is beaten into the chest by that baton that dangles between his legs. We all heard the yelp of excitement from the mat. Fermi had found a stick, and the object of his attention was a small wall gecko that was scrambling down the wall until it was less than a foot from Fermi's reach. In a flash, Femi split its head into unequal halves. The creature tumbled down the wall and lay belly up on the floor. Never in my life had I seen such wickedness. The boy is truly his mother's son. It surprised me that Bolanle could speak to us after Iafemi turned her like a spinning top. But they say a child who will play in the dark must first learn how to close its eyes. Bolanle wanted to play in the dark. She did not let Iafemi's behavior move her eyeballs. The very next day, she came to the sitting room and asked if any of us wanted to learn how to read. Iafemi stood up and hissed until she reached her bedroom door. Iasegi's knee began to shake as if she would kick a hole in Bolanle's head, but she just continued to count her money. I slowly lifted my hand. The look Iasegi gave me could have thrown me from my seat. But what could I do? What would you do if you could not understand the words that your children were reading? The first day, I sat at the table and watched as she showed me how to write big letter A. I copied the letter out myself. Even though she said it was upside down and not quite right, my stomach was swollen with pride. Me, writing. That night, Iyasegi came to my bedroom and told me she would destroy my useless life if I ever sat down to learn anything from Bolande again. What could I do? On the right was the person who gave me provisions and held my life and the lives of my daughters in the middle of her palm. On my left was the wife who wanted to teach me to read and write, the wife who did not yet know that she could also be crushed by Iyasegi's powerful fist. The choices we have to make in this world are hard and bitter. Sometimes we have no choices at all. I did not go near the dining room at noon. In fact, I did not answer when Bolanle came to knock on my door. What would I do with reading anyway? Even if I learned how to read, what would I do with it? How would I use it? That was how it was. Bolanle would come with suggestions, Iyasegi would listen and shake her knee, and Iyafemi would hiss for the world to hear. I learned to keep my head down and sing in my mind so I would not hear the sound of their voices. After a few months, the same Iyasegi, who said we should watch Bolanle from a distance, started to boil. She called me and Iafemi to a meeting, saying that there were words to be spoken. These words were nothing but curses and insults. The bigger Bolanle puffed out her chest, the smaller Iyasegi became. Iyasegi told us she had changed her plan, that it was no longer enough to wait until Bolanle's barrenness made Babasegi chase her out. Iyasegi said we had to join hands and force her out. Don't you see her high brow and unconcerned eyes? She thinks we are beneath her. She wants our husband to cast us aside as the illiterate ones, she said. As a wife who has recently joined our household, it is her duty to submit herself to our wishes, not to think she can teach us. I pointed out that Bolanle was kind to the children. What I really wanted to say was that it seemed Bolanle had learned to keep her suggestions deep in her stomach. In recent weeks, she had been keeping to her bedroom, only coming out when she was summoned. Was that not enough for them? Yasegi is right. She walks around as if she owns this house. Who made her queen over us? Envy seeped through every word that came out of Iafemi's mouth. And look at all the lace Babasegi buys her. What has she done to deserve it? But our husband has always bought the same for us all, I said. I was amazed that Iafemi was still so bitter about Bolanle's arrival. 
Iyaseji and I did not despise her this way when she joined us. Why are you defending her? Is it the same blood that runs through your veins? Is your allegiance faltering? Or have you forgotten that we are bound by the same oath? Iyafemi asked. I opened my mouth, but the words stuck to the walls of my throat. Let us only speak words that will push this matter forward. This girl has already been here five months, but I know there will be trouble if she stays, Iyasegi said. Iyasegi, you must have the gift of the Holy Spirit. In my church just last Sunday, a prophet saw a vision while he was praying for me. He said he saw a dark cloud edging towards me, heavy with rain. He said the cloud blew past, but when he looked in my direction, I was standing without a thread of cloth on my body. My hand flew to my mouth. Nakedness was never a good thing. Iyasegi nodded. Now that we are all lying with our heads in the same direction, we must work together to blow this cloud away. These educated types have pen skins. They are like pigeons. If we poke her with a stick, she will fly away and leave our home in peace. The first thing Iyasegi did was to talk to Babasegi about Bolanle's armchair. Babasegi had broken his rule for Bolanle. The tradition was that the comfort of an armchair had to be earned, which meant that unless you were pregnant with edema, breastfeeding, or watching over toddlers, you were not entitled to one. To impress his new wife, Babasegi spent 30 minutes in the dimly lit storeroom, dusting, slapping, and wiping, before finally pushing another armchair into the living room. Iyasegi and Iyafemi shook with anger when she sat amongst us. I asked myself, what is in a chair? Is it not just to sit down? Did she not have a chair in her father's house? But Babasegi soon started to grumble about the flatness of Bolanle's belly. And Iyasegi seized this opportunity to advise him that comfort made the female form complacent. She reminded him that she would know because she was a woman. Bolanle's armchair was returned to the store the next day. When Bolanle came into the living room, Iyafemi could not contain her mischievous smile and offered her a cushion. Babasegi avoided Bolanle's eyes the entire evening. The second evil thing that Iyasegi did was to banish Bolanle's friends from our house. After Yemisi and other friends visited for the third time, Iyasegi told our husband that they were bad role models for the daughters in the family, especially her daughter Segi, who was at an impressionable age. Babasegi jumped at the notion as if he had been looking for a reason to keep Bolanle for himself alone. He told Bolanle that he didn't want unmarried women near his doorstep. Bolanle received Babasegi's instructions without a word. She never once looked at her husband with annoyance. She just said she had things to buy at the market and quietly slipped out of the house. Iyasegi was wrong about the skin of educated types. The more those two poked Bolanle, the more mercy her eyes showed, the more her hands opened to the children. I have never known anyone like Bolanle before. Even after two years of their wickedness, she still greets them every morning. What more do they want? Just two weeks ago, my stomach was as hard as a fresh drum. For four days, I had not relieved myself. The more I ate, the harder my stomach became. Iyasegi saw me that morning, but she did not ask me about the pain that drew tears from my eyes. She looked away and walked past me. Iyafemi saw my bloodshot eyes too, but she just hissed, like she always does, as if I was an animal by the roadside. If not for Bolanli, maybe my stomach would have split open that day. She waited for the other wives to leave the house and came to knock on my door. She said she had seen that I was walking around like a woman pregnant with a grown man. I told her what was bothering me, and she ran to the kitchen to fetch three glasses of water. She told me to drink them and wait for her. I don't know where she went, but soon after, she ran back with a shopping bag. The two tablets she gave me chased me to the toilet. I thought I would find my intestines on the floor. I sat there for a whole hour, but when I finished, I felt like a human being again. It did not surprise me when Iyasegi called a meeting on the morning that Babasegi took Bolanle to the hospital. That Bolanle is a troublemaker, she said. She will destroy our home. She will expose our private parts to the wind. She will reveal our secrets. She will bring woe. Bolanle always tied Iyasegi's tongue in a knot. What are we going to do? Iyafemi asked. She locked her fingers over the dome of her head. We must do something quickly. Have we not done enough already? I don't think I want to be part of this anymore, I said. I don't know what came over me. Iyafemi picked me up with her eyes and threw me to the floor. Iyasegi shook her head and belched. Listen to the fool who begs for crumbs from Bolanle's table. 
the lick spittle. Hm. It is all right for you to say you do not want to be part of us after you have benefited from my wisdom all these years. Now you wish to remove yourself? <laughs> well, you can't. You are bound to us. We are all bound together. And if you dare to open that stupid mouth of yours, I will ruin you myself. I will tell my husband things that will make him wring your neck in your sleep. Go, take your small brain out of my sight, imbecile. I left them in the sitting room, so I don't know what they are planning. I fear for Bolanli, but I'm a coward. I know I should extend the arm of friendship to Bolanli. I should not pretend she is a stranger when the other wives are around. I should tell her to be careful, but I can't. I am afraid of these women. I will just keep quiet and watch. What else can a shit scraper do? Rat head. If Bolanli had known what lay in wait for her, perhaps she wouldn't have dallied so long in the market, wandering from stall to stall. Before she spotted the small crowd gathered in front of her home, she smelt Mama Elepa's groundnuts burning. As Bolanle moved closer, she was sure she could make out Mama Elepa's fragile frame, bent over from decades of carting firewood on their veranda. Most of the women she saw there were standing with their hands clasped behind their backs. Some had their hands on their heads and were hopping from leg to leg, as if their bladders held them hostage. Taju was leaning against a pillar, scratching his chin. Iyasegi's voice was loudest. Whoa! she yelled. Iyafemi was screaming in tongues. Iyatokwe had an arm around Segi, but the arm was limp like a wet cloth. Segi's eyes were red from weeping. Everyone looked around, nervously. She wants to kill him! Iyasegi pointed when Bolanle was within a few steps of the commotion. What did my father ever do to her? I'm not married yet. She wants to kill my father with Juju before he walks me down the aisle. Segi flopped to the concrete floor. The spectators, standing by, rushed to her aid. Of what use is she? She cannot have children. Her womb is dead. She wants to kill our husband to save herself from shame. I am too young to be a widow, Yafemi added. When Bolanle stepped onto the concrete floor of the veranda, the crowd went quiet. The bystanders stepped back and made a path for her. In the sitting room, Baba Segi was in his armchair. His arms were slung over the sides, his great legs stretched out in front of him like logs. Good evening, Baba Segi. Why have you not changed your clothes? Bolanli asked. Where have you been? It is not even six yet. I am here on time, like I said I would be. The question I am asking is, where have you been? His voice was deep and hollow, like the aftermath of a drumbeat. <laughs> So I can't even leave the house now. It was a daring response. In a flash, Baba Segi scrambled up the back of his seat and leapt into the air like a gorilla in flight. He landed bang in front of Bolanli and gripped her throat with both hands. He squeezed hard and shook her, pressing his thumbs on her windpipe. Who are you asking questions? Do I look like a fool? You said you were going to your father's house. Taju has just come back. Nobody there has seen you today. Where have you been? The market. I went to the market. Her voice was hoarse from the pressure. You can kill me, Baba Segi, but I only went to the market. Look at the ball I bought. Baba Segi searched her face and thought how strange it was that there was no fear in it, just pain. He glanced to the side and saw the plastic bag a few inches from her open palm. He let his arms drop to his sides. Bolanle collapsed. Aki made to rush towards Bolanle, but Iya Segi's arm shot out from her side and held him in his tracks. His mother's arm was steadfast, so he bowed his head and ran off down the road. Yatope knelt beside Bolanli. With Baba Segi towering over them, she slapped Bolanli's cheeks lightly. Tell him, Bolanli. Tell him if you did it. Tell him. He will forgive you. We have all offended our husband before. He always forgives us. Confess to him. Bolanli spluttered and grabbed her throat. The dry weather had split her lips and a solitary droplet of blood trickled from one of the creases in them. Tokwe, bring me some water. Iyatokwe didn't take her eyes off Bolanli until her daughter returned with half a plastic cup of warm recently boiled water. Iyatokwe sprinkled some on Bolanli's face and placed the cup to her lips. Bolanli looked up at the woman cradling her head in the crook of her arm. Confess to what? Babasegi marched to the stool beside the armchair 
and produced a see-through polythene bag. This, he spat, pinching the bag at the corner farthest away from what it contained. At the bottom of the bag, looking vaguely surprised by all the attention it was getting, was the head of a decomposed rodent. A large bush rat, perhaps. Tell me why I found this in my bedroom. There were bits of dried flesh stuck to it. Its mouth was bound together by red thread. A four-inch nail had been knocked into its crown, shattering the skull at the point of entry, then driven all the way in until it protruded out of the rodent's throat. Bolanle's face hardened. How can I confess to something I know nothing about? Strangle me! Kill me! But first ask yourself if I would descend this low. Do you really think I would touch something so revolting? Do you really think I would go to a babalao, let alone ask for something that would harm you? If I didn't want to be with you, would I not just leave? Yasegi was by the door. She saw the opening and jumped in. Who can tell why she would do this, Babasegi? She wants to kill you first and then leave. She is a destroyer of homes. Why didn't she go to the abattoir if she was thirsty for blood? Ah! There is no blood for you here, Bolanle. There is no blood for you here. She paused and turned to Iyatokwe. We've been suspicious for some months now, haven't we, Iyatokwe? Iyatokwe looked at the other wife. She opened her mouth, but no words came out. She tried again, but her lips just opened and closed, like a fish anticipating a maggot. Iyasegi, I have never desired blood in my life. Bolanle felt tears, welling up in her eyes, but she blinked them back. Then why was this found in your bedroom? Babasegi's voice was calmer now. He was beginning to see that things didn't quite add up, but he decided to see it through so he could observe her reaction. Stand up and come and see for yourself. I will not touch it. He sighed with relief when Bolanli crawled towards what someone had pushed beneath a stool. In a small calabash, there was a spool of once white thread, half immersed in a pool of blood. Unspeakable, Bolanli hissed. She turned and looked up at Babasegi. Do you think so little of me? Babasegi looked away, but Yasegi would not let it go. Oh, <laughs> it is unspeakable now you've been found out. Who would have known that all those times you left the house, you were visiting a babalawo? Who would have thought that a graduate would stoop to something so unspeakable? <laughs> Yasegi pronounced the word unspeakable as if she was swallowing a single grain of corn. A clocking started deep within her double chin. Bolande put one hand on the side of her neck and grimaced. She let her head roll round in a full circle before turning to her husband. She coughed to clear her throat. I have nothing to say, Babasegi, except that I do not know where these things came from. There must be some mistake. I have never seen anything like this before. To the small crowd that had gathered in the sitting room, Bolande said, I say, I have never seen these things before in my life. Neither do I want to ever again. Why would I want to kill my husband? If I become tired of my husband, there isn't a policeman in the world that can force me to stay with him. I am here because I want to be here. She exhaled long and meaningfully. I have lived in this house for two years and I want to continue to stay if my husband will have me. Only today, we went to the doctor to see how I could bear his children. I do not want to die barren. How is it profitable for me to become a young widow? Why would I want my child or any of these young children to be fatherless? Her hands reached to brush Femi's head, but he ducked. Everyone looked on in sympathy, and Segi wiped away her tears with the back of her hand. Iyasegi read the situation and stole into the crowd like a giant hen skulking to a secret stash of corn. Just above a whisper, Babasegi said, Olanli, you can go to your room. To everyone's surprise, Iyafemi catapulted herself towards him from the edge of the crowd. Go to her room, she shrieked. Is this after she has killed all of us that you will do the right thing? If this woman is allowed to sleep in this house, I will sleep outside with my sons. I will hold a night vigil and pray her out. She bounced on the balls of her feet, her upstretched arms exposing clumps of armpit hair. Iyafemi, <laughs> you can sleep in the gutter if you want to. Babasegi's voice was calm, but anger had returned to his eyes. That is where you came from. My sons were not born to sleep in the gutter, so they cannot follow you. 
Iyatope, take my sons to bed. This woman's mouth will soon get what it deserves. Anyone who touches my sons may not live to tell the tale. Has this woman's head scattered that she now scrubs my mouth? Have my words become so insignificant that they can now be contested? He opened one of his hands to the crowd as if they would deposit the answers to his questions into his palm. Iyasegi! Iyasegi! Perched on a crumbling concrete block by the side wall, Iyasegi remained still until several voices echoed her husband's call. I am here, my lord. This house is in a mess. Clean it! Right away, my lord. Their voyeuristic thirsts quenched. Everyone got the message and began to agitate for a speedy exit. The spectacle had been gratifying. The outcome, glorious. Babasegi couldn't bear to stay at home that evening, so he drove himself to Aikara. I could have killed her with my bare hands, my own wife. Oh, it was as if a wild beast from inside me wanted to suck blood from her throat. Babasegi didn't want the three men in the far corner of the shack to hear him. It didn't matter that there was an empty bottle of teacher's whiskey on the table in front of them, or that the few phrases they exchanged were slurred and incoherent. This was a matter Babasegi did not want to discuss with strangers. And you say she did not fight back? No, she was calm. What fight can a fly fight when it is in the clutches of a tarantula? Babasegi muttered and looked away. Calm is not the reaction of someone who has been caught red-fingered. Remind me, how did your other wives react to this discovery? You mentioned that. That is what I don't understand. Babasegi cut him short. Apart from one of them, who seemed as perplexed as I was, the other two were adamant that Bolale had planted the juju. They were convinced that she was guilty. Hmm. Teacher smirked and nodded knowingly. What are the relations like between Bolanle and these other wives? There must be a reason why they were fighting tongue and nail for her to confess. Well, in recent months, I myself have been hostile to the young woman, but only because of this question of her barrenness. Her unwillingness to submit to my earlier solutions also hardened my heart. <sighs> I have not been warm to her. I think perhaps... My wives noticed this and copied me. So they want you to send her away. And you think it is a reaction to your annoyance? I know they do. They said so in my presence, in her presence. Why have they not attempted to mediate? From what you've always said about your first wife, I'd come to believe she was of a more agreeable temperament. I would be lying if I said she wasn't. That woman knows every thought that enters my head. She knows when I am thirsty and when my belly is full. She knows when I have been disgruntled about Bolanle and I suspect she just wants to relieve me of my troubles. But planting juju is excessive. Why use a hammer to swat an insect? As if to illustrate his point, teacher elegantly flicked a fly from his shot glass. It must have seemed reasonable to her, given how displeased I've been. I agree with you though. It was as if Ishu himself came to dine in my house this evening. I tell you I could have killed Bolanle. Babasegi folded his arms and shook his head. Listen, Babasegi, perhaps you are partly to blame for what has happened. Your partiality is the cause of these problems. Women do not hesitate to become cannibals when they are hungry. That is why I have never kept one. Some people laugh about this behind my back. But what they don't know is this. He who does not have a head has no need for a cap. Yes, indeed. But back to the trouble in your household. It is my belief that the solution lies with you. And I can tell you that Bolanle's university degree is not helping matters either. His finger wrapped on the side of his glass. Uh, I, I don't understand. Teacher took a sip from his whiskey and winced when he swallowed. What I mean is that she's different. It may well be that your other wives are slightly uncomfortable about this. They may think it gives her an edge. Teacher chose his words carefully. What sort of edge? I do not sleep with anyone more than the other. Mm, it is more complicated than that. It could be that they are envious. That I can rule out. Babasegi was afraid the teacher would suggest that he too was prone to such feelings. A smile tickled the corners of teacher's lips, but he didn't submit to it. 
If you are sure that this is not the case, then it all lies in your hands. Treat your wives equally. Blacken the kettle as you blacken the pots. Queen, Ia Femi. When a plan does not go right, you plot it again. One day you will succeed. One day you will be able to damage the person who hurts you so completely that they will never be able to recover. I have told Yasegi this on several occasions. I keep telling her that we need to find a permanent solution. But she does not have wisdom. She says we should continue to humiliate Bolandi until she runs away. Let us cut her feathers, she says. Well, the bird has shown that she can fly without feathers. I knew we should have gone for her throat. We should have bled her into a hole in the earth. I have suffered too much in my life to let that rat spoil it all for me. So what if she's a graduate? When we stand before God on the last day, will he ask whether we went to university? No, but he will want to know if we were as wise as serpents, because that's what the Bible says we should be. If we let Bolanle ruin us, then we will all have failed before God. I reject failure in Jesus' name. I will not fail. The prophets in my church have seen that this rat has an evil spirit. I cannot say God has not revealed it to me too. He shows himself to all who serve him in spirit and in truth. I am glad Yasegi has come round to my thinking. She has now seen that we need to do something. Now that Babasegi has taken the rats to the hospital, time is short. When Bolanle first arrived, I scrubbed her tongue with bitter leaf. <laughs> I made her understand who was in charge of this house. I showed her the sting of hot peppers. If she comes to this world again, she will run if she hears the name Yafemi. Let me tell you one of the things I did. <laughs> Laughter kills me when I think of it. I don't think she had been with us for a year when Baba Segi asked me to make Ashoe be for the entire household. The neighbor's birthday was in two weeks' time and he wanted us all dressed in the same fabric from top to bottom. I want you all to look like queens, he said. <laughs> I looked at him and I wondered why, if he wanted wives that looked like queens, he married a woman like a toad or that scrawny rabbit that nibbles at Bolande's borrow. And that's Bolande. Is that his idea of a queen? Being a graduate does not make you beautiful. I know true beauty, and it is in pale yellow skin. I was born darker than this, but I use expensive creams to make my natural beauty shine. I take my nails to a proper nail studio. I buy good makeup, unlike that Bolanle, who wanders around with her face as haggard as a sack. Mm, queens indeed. Anyway, on the day I went to collect the clothes, I came out of the house and I heard Bantu's no more no vernacular <laughs> screaming from giant speakers on the neighbor's fence. I danced into the pickup, <laughs> leaving the entire family in the sitting room. The tailor store was only 20 minutes away, but <laughs> I stopped at a few places. <laughs> By the time I got home, even my sons were sweating from anticipation. I rushed into the sitting room, arms laden, and surrendered the pile of clothes to the stool by Iasegi's feet. The witch sniffed the air around me. <laughs> she must have picked up the scent on my thighs. <laughs> uh, I was waiting for the tailor to put finishing touches to your clothes, I said. Would you have preferred it if I came home without them? It is wonderful that we will all be dressed the same. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could pat myself on the back. My cunning knows no bounds. For a few moments, Iyasegi stared at the outfits. The children couldn't conceal their impatience. My mother, <coughs> the clothes. I can pretend to cough as he spoke so his mother wouldn't think him wayward. Iyasegi cocked her head with interest before reaching for the pile and placing it on her lap. The witch touched all the clothes before anyone, as if she wanted to render them secondhand. She fingered the plastic buttons and touched the threading before giving each outfit to its respective owner. One by one, everyone stepped forward. Yasegi told Yatokwe to drop Bolande's clothes by her bedroom door. She said everyone should return to the sitting room in 30 minutes so we could set off for the party. I got dressed quickly and headed to the sitting room so I could see everyone coming. <laughs> Yasegi caught me in the corridor as she came out of her bathroom. She ran her eyes over my outfit. Such beautiful gold thread. Such fine sequins, she said. Her throat was thick with fury. <laughs> uh, the tailor said he ran out of sequins when he started to sew yours. He said the girl who sold them to him was in confinement. But if you want, let us exchange. I'll wear yours and you can wear mine. I even started to unzip my blouse at the side. <laughs> She would be lucky if she could fit just one of her breasts into my entire blouse. She hissed and turned into her bedroom. Babasegi joined me soon after to inspect us the way he always did. As the children walked in, he looked with pride at the parade of red stars against royal blue. 
He nodded as his eyes went from face to face. Yasegi soon waddled in. Her dress resembled a pillowcase, with long sleeves and a ruffled collar that extended all the way up to her ears. That thick neck of hers is an embarrassment. If she always had to wear clothes with high collars, maybe she would eat less. Maybe she'd stop grunting like a pig. Iyatokwe, for her part, looked no different from her three daughters. Did she not behave like them? Was she any cleverer than they were? I told the tailor to sew the skirt two sizes too big and her blouse baggy and without darts. The neck gaped and slid off one of her shoulders. As usual, she didn't say anything. She was more concerned about Bolanle, who had just emerged from her bedroom. Bolanle's outfit looked like it had been knocked together by a roguish hand. To be honest, I sewed it myself. I watched the tailor on a few occasions and made the skirt from the discoloured ends that he did away with. Instead of the square meter that the rest of the wives received as headgear, Bolanle's head was bound by a bright purple strip of cloth about eight inches wide. I don't even remember where the cloth came from. Her face was bland, as if there wasn't a single thought in her head. Who knows what the lizard was thinking? Everyone stared at her. Iyatokme drew her palm to her lips, but Iyasegi's eyes began to twinkle. <laughs> I knew she would like it. My husband finally asked me to stand up. <laughs> you can trust me. I gave him the queen he asked for. My skirt was fitted and the slit rode just above my knee. My blouse was adorned with crystals and the darts shaped my figure and lifted my breasts. I was well accessorized too. Matching court shoes and bag, coral beads on my wrists and a large gold crucifix around my neck. It was a good day. Back to the present problem. Iyasegi and I decided to meet on our own after the rathead incident. That stupid Iyatope ruined it all, I said. Let us thank the gods that she did not tell Bolanle beforehand. I thought she would carry Bolanle to her bedroom to breastfeed her. Iyatope's foolishness could start a village war. The only chance we had was to be united. Now see how Bolanle marches about the house gloating. The stone in Iyasegi's throat was traveling up and down like a man's. Iyatope is a traitor. She's like the demon who accused the gnomes of mischief. He woke up to find his sword inside his own belly and there was nothing he could do. Nothing! He lay in the forest with his blood clotting at his side, too weak to stand, too frail to shout. Iyasegi, forget about Iyatope. Let us take care of this matter ourselves. We have the wisdom and the strength. Between the two of us, we can restore this home to what it was. Hm. You have spoken well, Iyafemi. You have spoken the truth. Trade, Iyasegi. The blood that runs through the daughters that Iyatope brought into this home of mine is dirty. Her children are sickly. Not long after Bolanle arrived, Iyatope sat in the sitting room looking for pity. She likes to sit around the house, plaiting her daughter's hair like a beggar in the marketplace. Moto had a fever that morning, and Baba Segi insisted that she stay at home. When her sisters heard that they would be separated from her, they sobbed and wept. The middle one, Afolake, strained and wriggled in her seat. Tokwe, the eldest, begged to stay at home so she could look after her sisters. I do not tolerate such rubbish, so I told the older two I would whip them all the way to their classrooms if they did not get into the bus. I don't understand these children of yours, I told Yatokwe. The affection they have for each other has become unhealthy. They are like forsaken triplets lost in a forest, each unable to survive without the other. They want to eat from the same plate, wear the same hairstyle, speak with the same voice. Will they marry the same husband? After dropping the children at school, I returned home. As I stepped onto the veranda outside, I heard Bolanle asking Iyatokwe if the child was better. Much better, thank you. I swathed her in a wet cloth for about ten minutes. My children do not cope well without sleep. They scratch their heads all night. Look. As I entered, Iyatokwe was parting her daughter's hair with a wooden comb to reveal a line of scalp that was scabby in parts and freshly clawed in others. I have hair cream that is good for dandruff. Let me get some for you, Bolanli suggested. Iyatokwe, why are you begging for hair cream? I asked. Are you not satisfied with what your husband gives you? That you now have to scrounge. You should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, I offered, Bolanli said. I am the one you should come to when you are in need. In fact, I think Baba Segi should hear of this ingratitude. I did not ask for hair cream, so there is nothing to tell Baba Segi. Iyatokwe reached behind her daughter and produced a container with nothing more than a smidgen of cream in it. Iyatokwe shifted a fraction of an angle in her seat to show that she was no longer receptive to Bolanle's company or her conversation. She busied herself with her daughter's hair and said nothing. Bolanle noticed it and left the room. 
it is important that the wives know their place in this house. They must know what they can and cannot do. They must remember that I am the one who tells them when to eat, sleep, or even work. Not that they've shown a desire to. Iyafemi has sworn never to do another day's work in her life. Iyatokbe doesn't have a head for trade. <laughs> what am I saying? She doesn't have a head for reason. I had to use all my wisdom to force Babasegi's hand. After giving birth to Ake, my second child, a son for that matter, I knew the ache in Babasegi's balls would have subsided. That's when I made his head spin with worry. I started with the sigh. Hey, I would lie next to him in bed and sigh. He didn't seem to take notice, so I'd sigh, sit up, and shake my head hopelessly. I had to do this on several occasions before it finally occurred to Babasegi that he might not be a perfect husband if his wife is saddened. Men are like that. They think they sit in the center and the world turns around them. When he inquired what was causing my distress, I told him it was nothing and blew my nose into my wrapper. After a few weeks of this, I took to crying. I thought thinking sad thoughts would bring tears to my eyes, but I found I couldn't evoke any. It was as if my mind had decided that my life had been without adversity. I had to use onions. My hands always smelt of them anyway. One night, after Babasegi had climbed off me, I smeared my eyeballs with onion juice. Babasegi couldn't take my sniveling. He sat up and turned on the light. What is it that has twisted your insides, my wife? There was both weariness and earnestness in his voice. It is nothing, my lord. The time was not exactly right. That is all you say. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Yet you weep like a mourner. It's nothing. I cried silently, so I would not wake my children in their cots. Is it the house? I shook my head. Almost. Is it me? Is there something you want to do? My lord, my hands itch for work. Work? Are your hands not full with the children you are taking care of? I dropped to my knees and told him of my wish to have a small stall where I could sell sweets wholesale, interact with other women, and learn of new recipes. The best household detergents on the market? Better ways to please a husband? I slipped it in when I noticed each blink weighed down his eyelids longer than the one before. I also want to attend driving school. He raised both eyebrows and widened his eyes. I will be able to take my children to daycare without them sweltering in the heat like poverty-stricken orphans. Shutting his eyes tight, he stretched up his arms and yawned. He lay back down, slid his bottom down the bed and covered himself with a sheet. When he'd sufficiently borrowed into his pillow with the back of his head, he asked, If I permit you to do these things, will a man be able to sleep in his own house? Long and soundly, my lord, long and soundly. Within months, I informed him that wholesale sweets were no longer lucrative and that a wise woman had advised me to try selling cement. A few weeks later, this same mysterious woman, who lived her life for her husband, advised me to extend my stall and build a proper shop. Before the year was out, I was talking of a second shop, but only so I could be nearer to the children. Men are so simple, they will believe anything. Does your friend approve of this? Babasegi asked as he undressed one night. Which one? I spoke before thinking, but corrected myself quickly. Oh, you mean my friend from the market? Did I not tell you that she died? Died? Yes, just like that. She just uh, slumped and died. The lucky woman has departed this world of sin and strife. This is very unfortunate. Did you attend the funeral? You forget that I have two children and a husband to look after. She was a Muslim, so they buried her the day after. Let us pray the wind that carries her soul to heaven will be a gentle one, so that the journey will be without turbulence. That is how I started my business. And that is how I learned to drive. <laughs> Men are like yam. You cut them how you like. One day, about three months after Bolande arrived, I was in the sitting room counting my money. I wouldn't usually be at home at this time of morning, but I wanted to rent a new shop space. And the previous owner demanded payment that afternoon. I had shops in most of the major markets. Mokola, Dube, Eleyeli, Songo. But I wanted to have one in Ojo too. Rather than rush to the bank and endure hours in the queues, I decided to take from the stash I hid under my mattress at home to save time. The banknotes were old, crumpled and dirty, but that has never bothered me. I sat in one of the armchairs and crammed a stool into the small space between my knees. I handle money with great affection. I like the feel of it on my palm, so I turned each note meticulously until I could see the man in all of them. I didn't know that our stray hen 
had brought friends until I heard them rattling down the corridor. Before they came into the sitting room, I pulled my skirt over the stool. They greeted me and I greeted them back. I hope we will see you again, I said. I meant to address both visitors, but I couldn't stop my gaze from returning to Yemisi. As soon as the door closed behind them, I jumped out of my armchair and peered through a hole in my clenched fist so I could see Yemisi's perfect form. Ah, if only desire didn't always carry trouble on its back. Now is not the time, I told myself. There is a time for everything. Iya Tope Nine years ago, I came home from the farm to find Baba Segi sitting in my father's hut. I was 23 years old. I remember. It was later in the year that my older brother declared that I was ripe for marriage. My mother did not tell him to mind his mouth. Instead, without raising her face from the heap of melon seeds, she added, Truth be told, she is bordering on decay. I cannot forget that day, not because their words did not cause me sorrow, but because I remember thinking how unjust it was that the gods had blessed them with such wondrous eyes. How was it that they could see the womanhood that I, on whose body it was plastered, could not? Within me, I was certain I was still a child. I thought like a child and enjoyed childish pleasures, like pursuing ants as they carried away sugar lumps and scratching hardened scabs from the edge of my old wounds. I even conversed with friends that only I could see. My father was from a long line of cassava farmers who learned to hoe cassava mounds before the age of three and hacked the brown nuggets from the soil until the day they too were planted in fertile land. Unlike most villages, ours did not have a school or electricity. The nearest school was six miles down the main road. Elders scowled at the more eager pupils. The time it took to walk to school and back could be better spent, they said. By the time hair sprouted from the armpits, most children had their own cassava stalls on the edge of the highway. As for electricity, we didn't send gifts to the local government chief like other villages. We were simple people. What the ground didn't give, we didn't yearn for. Most people looked forward to the planting season, but I hated it. I detested the hoeing and wished away the heavy watering cans. So when it was time for planting, I complained of backache. I lay groaning on my mat while my brothers and sisters unfastened their hoes from the nails that had been hammered into the hut wall. As I rolled from side to side, clutching my back, I dreamt of the day weeds would cluster around the cassava shoots. Weeding, I loved. I loved the feel of the small leaves, the strength of the stems. I loved shaking the soil from the roots and laying them in a row. Sometimes I liked to hawk them to my imaginary friends. Good fresh spinach. Buy your fresh spinach. My father called me one day and asked when exactly I planned to finish weeding the family vegetable patch. Soon, Baba. And when I finish, I will start again, I replied. Your age mates are planting, grinding, drying and selling. But you creep around the farm, sweating over weeds until your shadow lengthens. I am thorough, Baba. With weeding, you must be thorough. My daughter, men want women who can work beside them on the farm, not behind them. Your younger sister has suitors who would climb a thousand trees to win her hand. Are you not concerned that no one has turned their mouth to talk of marrying you? Maybe the men you speak of have not seen how thoroughly I can weed. Have you not heard the words I have spoken? He let out a long breath and seized his walking stick. Without another glance in my direction, he drew lines on the earthen floor, a cluster of strokes, and then about a yard apart, one stroke standing all by itself. In those days, it was common for wealthy men who owned Gary factories in Ibadan to dazzle village farmers with their big cars and big money talk. They leased farmland and paid the villagers to tend the crops that grew on it. Their goal was to reap the yield from crops that they had never nurtured. My brother said that was the way of the rich. The year before, my father had been greatly pleased when he waved goodbye to two trucks full of hefty cassava tubers. He received more money than he had ever seen and he kept the wad of crisp notes in his trouser pocket for days, smiling every time his knuckles brushed against them. Babasegi had returned for another prosperous harvest the following year, but he was met by fidgety fingers and eyes that darted downwards, sideways, then upwards to the gods. My father was afraid, so he gave Babasegi the news in full view of the entire village. Sitting on a bench next to my father, Babasegi looked like a hungry demon. His skin was oily and supple, whereas my father's was flaky and dry like orobo shells. 
Babasegi's shiny face didn't show any reaction to the news, but his toes flapped in leather slippers like the ears of a dog. Then quite unexpectedly, he looked around and seized the boy by the arm. Take me to the toilet, he begged. Every eye watched Babasegi as he barged through the door of the unroofed pit latrine. We heard every rumble, every gurgle, every fart and every splutter. When Babasegi emerged, he reoccupied the space on the bench and told the dumbstruck villagers that everything happened for a reason and that he was thinking of a new business anyway. He added that the ways of the gods were mysterious. The truth was that the rains had punished the village of Borodi by refusing to fall and the sun had dealt mercilessly with the cassava shoots. Instead of standing high and cooling the soil with their broad green leaves, they stooped and coiled until they were toasted like bristles. The ground hardened and split from the heat, forcing anxious villagers to journey to the forest in search of water to moisten the soil. Even my father, with his bent back, followed the trail of water fetchers. He got on his knees and scooped sand until his fingers touched water. I was frustrated too. No water meant no weeds. Since the sun denied me my joy that year, I hid under the pile of mats at home, as far away from its wrath as possible. It was only when I heard the wind carrying voices home from the forest path that I abandoned my hiding place to help them ease calabashes off their heads. My father's wife sneered at my helpfulness and my mother hid her face behind her wrapper. On the day Babasegi was to cut off his bad harvest, my father sat on a stool outside his hut and stared at the miserable baskets, six in number. His legs were stretched out in front of him and his chin rested on his walking stick. When I surfaced from my mother's hut to slice okra, I greeted him. He didn't respond, but followed me with his eyes. He made me feel so self-conscious that I took my okra back to my mother's hut. Soon afterwards, Babasegi's pickup appeared at the end of the dusty road. My father shouted my name and instructed me to turn out a large mound of amala to be accompanied by a four made from the freshest spinach leaves I could find. My father didn't wait for Babasegi's feet to touch the ground. He scooped him out of the pickup and into the darkness of his hut. It did not take me any time to prepare the meal, so when I finished, I joined my mother and her co-wives in the shade of the palm fronds. My siblings sat there too, slapping off gnats that perched on their bare shoulders. I found it strange that they were being so quiet. They normally talked with their mouths, their arms, their necks, their eyes and their lips. They talked about everything from the texture of snake meat to the oval guavas by the river. Sitting in the middle of this strange heavy silence, I wondered whether I should seize the opportunity to say something. It didn't look like they would cut me short and take over my voice the way they usually did. Just when the sun began its journey into the treetops, my father summoned me. I was surprised to find him and Babasegi sitting so close together, their arms touching as they drained the bottle of schnapps that was normally only sipped at weddings and funerals. My father told me to bring the food in and I returned with a wide tray. But as I stooped at the doorframe, the men stopped talking. Babasegi inspected me as I placed the plates on a low stool and fetched cold water from the earthen pot. He examined my face as I poured it into two plastic cups. My father watched him, watching me. She is not a great beauty, <laughs> I heard my father saying as I closed the door. His discretion had dwindled with the schnapps. But she's as strong as three donkeys, and thorough too. What she loses in wit, she gains in meticulousness. <laughs> This is a great virtue in a woman. I have three wives, so I speak from experience. <laughs> Even a child would have worked out why my father was extolling qualities that had previously vexed him. I was compensation for the failed crops. I was just like the tubers of cassava in the basket. Maybe something even less, something strange. A tuber with eyes, a nose, arms and two legs. Without fanfare or elaborate farewells, I packed my bags. I didn't weep for my mother or my father or even my siblings. It was the weeds I didn't get the chance to uproot that year that bothered me. I should have known something unusual would happen that year. The drought did something to my ears. Whenever I spoke to my spirit friends, their words were muffled, as if spoken, from a plot on a faraway land. Taju threw my belongings in the back, two plastic bags and two tubers of yam. I sat between the two men in the pickup and stared ahead at roads I had never travelled before. So this was Ibadan. The big city where all our second-hand clothes enjoyed their first outings. The place where cars honked, engines roared, and bus conductors screamed. I covered my ears. Everything was so urgent, most unlike the leisurely pace at which things bumbled along in the village. In the middle of all this noise, Babasegi asked me if I was happy about being his wife. I couldn't utter a single word. I wanted to say something. I should have said something, but I couldn't. It has always been hard for me to speak my feelings. 
even now when I try to say things. My mouth opens and closes, like a fish waiting for a hook. I choke words and swallow them. I didn't have to worry about this in the village because my family could read my mind. Just before I left, I went to my father's hut and stood by the door. I didn't need to say anything, the same way he didn't need to look at me. I have made my decision and it's final, he said. When we arrived at Babasegi's house, he pushed me towards Yasegi and warned that I should show her great respect. He said I should be grateful that I was in such good hands. Iyasegi smiled, but I could see her chest thumping beneath her buba. Her neck had a scarf of skin wrapped around it. She squinted at the lacy dress my mother told me to wear for the journey. It was more suited to a 15-year-old, but I liked the way it rustled when I walked. Her eyes swept across the tiny fruits on my chest, which had never been groped or suckled. If not for fists drawn like daggers at her side, it would have been impossible to tell what she was hiding behind the creased eyes and that set smile. She was not happy to see me, and by the time her husband finished the introductions, the lamps in her eyes were dead. Come to my room, she said. I have good soap that you can wash yourself with. I will also give you clothes to wear. Your rags cannot stay in this house. All the time her lips moved, her dead eyes were fixed on Babasegi, so he wouldn't miss a word. Then, slinging her son onto her hip, she admonished me for my silence. You are a wife now, not a child. Say thank you to your husband and follow me. Several months after, she knocked on my door in the middle of the night. She must have crawled out from under Babasegi, because back then it was just the two of us. She had Babasegi four times a week, and I had him thrice. I would have happily given up my nights as well. There were weeks I ached so much I could hardly sit. Get pregnant quickly, or he will start to force-feed you bitter concoctions from medicine men until your belly rumbles in your sleep, she said. For many weeks, her words kept me awake at night. Then one day, as she had predicted, Babasegi asked me what was wrong with my womb. If your father has sold me a rotten fruit, it will be returned to him. His words bothered me even more than Yasegi's. I didn't want to go back to the village. In Babasegi's house, I did not have to plant or harvest cassava. Apart from the daily chores Iyasegi allotted me, all I did was plait and play with Segi's hair. Her hair was jet black, every strand was strong, combing it was like weeding. It took time and nimble fingers, but the results were beautiful. I will not mention the name of the man I met, because I am ashamed. All I'll say is that he was the meat seller Iyasegi sent me to every Wednesday. Although his meat was always tasty, I still asked him whether the cow that was opened up on the table was killed on the day. He replied that his meat was always fresh and scraped some orange marrow into his mouth to prove it. He smiled. His teeth were not white, but they looked like they could crack many bones. His tongue was pink and his eyebrows met above his nose. He was from Iwo. I could tell from the incisions that darkened his cheeks. He nodded and cut 500 naira worth of meat into small cubes, all the time listening to another butcher's anecdote with one ear. It was not until I untied my wrapper that I realized that the money wasn't where I'd knotted it. What grown woman throws away money her father does not have so carelessly? I felt like a child again. For a while, he watched me scramble and search the muddy ground. Then, I think when he was sure I was not pretending, he asked me to stop troubling myself. Markets are dangerous places, and women were often disgraced for such misdeeds, so I was lucky. I offered to leave the meat and return later with the money, but he insisted that I take it with me. He said he would be at his stall until four o'clock. I gathered all the money Babasegi had given me over the months and quickly explained what had happened to Iyasegi. Make sure something worthwhile comes out of all this foolishness, she murmured. The days are passing quickly, and your village calls you. She emptied the diced beef into the kitchen sink and waved me away. I caressed Segi's hair for a few seconds and left. He was already scraping his table down with a knife when I got there. I did not doubt for a minute that you would come, he said. I let him see that I had brought more than I owed and pressed the money into his hand. I held it there and took his eyes into mine. At first he looked surprised, but then he closed his fingers around the money and told me to sit and wait for him to finish his cleaning. My heart rejoiced, so there were other people on this earth who could tell what was on my mind. He led me to his home, and he took me. I will never forget that day, or any other day that I spent with him. He made my body sing, 
He made me howl when he bent me over. He made me whimper when he sat me on his belly. And when he took me standing up, it was as if there was a frog inside me, puffing out its throat, blowing, blowing, blowing until whoosh. All the warm air escaped through my limbs. Even when my belly was rounded, I continued to go to him. I couldn't help myself. There was something he gave me that I wanted constantly, endlessly. Three days after I gave birth to my first daughter, I waited for Babasegi to leave for his new building material store. As soon as Taju drove him away, I tied the infant to my back and sat on a boulder outside the meat seller's home. When he arrived, he asked me if the child was a boy or a girl. I completely forgot that I even carried a child on my back. Please do not blame me. It was eagerness. I had not been with him for a week. By the time he had hung up all his tools, I had removed the baby and my clothes and laid them down in a neat pile on the floor. Tokwe was a good baby. She did not cry. He asked me if I'd brought him some money. I wondered if he lay with me for the money alone. For four years, that's how I lived. Three days of pummeling from Babasegi and a day of healing from the meat seller. Those afternoons were worth life itself. And it was not until one morning, after I had given birth to Moton, my third daughter, that I realized how little of life remained outside those afternoons. Iyasegi burst into my room, her brow folded with anger, the skin around her throat rippling. Can you not hear the infant crying? she shouted. Oh, my thoughts were far away. I got up to lift the child out of her cot. Her small eyes were glazed from crying. I placed my nipple into her mouth. As I looked around for my other children, Iyasegi's eyes followed mine. Afolake was sitting in a corner, pushing what was leaking out of her nappy into Tokwe's nostrils. Tokwe was fast asleep. All her clothes were inside out. Too far away, Iyasegi pinched her nose and perched on the edge of the bed. Last week, our husband asked me if you were sick. He said there was a bad smell in your room. She looked around suspiciously, as if something catching would jump out of the walls. I will not let you destroy this home with your excess. You have allowed the concubine to become the husband. I have not known anyone to worship a penis the way you do. She stopped to take a long breath. Listen carefully to what I have to say, because if I am forced to say it again, it will be wedged between curses. You will not see this man again. You are like a child who has not developed the temperament for secrets. You are lucky we have a husband who believes he is more than all women and most men. If he were more discerning, more like a woman, say, he would have seen through your madness. And anyway, a new wife is coming, so brace yourself. I just hope she has some sense in her head. She left the room, dangling Afolake by the arm. I heard her yell Segi's name and instruct her to scrub the child thoroughly in the backyard where the dirty water would be absorbed into the ground. I sat there quietly and watched Moton twitching in her sleep. She was six days old. Her mouth had abandoned my breast. She looked so small and so unloved. A deep, damning shame came over me. I could not believe that I had neglected the children who bought me the easy life I lived. There and then, I decided to become a better mother. I would be a liar if I said I wasn't tempted to visit my meat seller. I was. The yearning was hard to bear. But each time the urge came, I bit my bottom lip and rocked myself to sleep with a pillow between my knees. The body quickly remembers how to die in the face of pain. I cast sweetness from my mind and drew my children close to fill its space. Iyasegi was right. A new wife arrived. She was tall and lean, yet you could see that she had whipped her life onto the road of her choice. She had great strength in her forearms, and she did everything with determination. Iyasegi spoke sourly of me and referred to me as Apoda, the stupid, slothful one behind my back. Tokwe, my daughter, told me so. It would not surprise me if they were plotting to throw me and my daughters into a well. Iafemi, the new wife, soon gave birth to a son, and there was much celebration. The new mother clapped her knees together when she sat and strutted about as if her womb was a gold mine. That was to be expected, but it was Babasegi's words that made my ears ache. He spoke as if Femi was a jewel, as if he was the first child to be born to the family. A daughter can never be like a son, he said. Only a son can become a true heir. Yasegi promptly reminded him that he already had an heir in Aki, her own son. 
My daughters were born with eyes in their stomachs, so they are quick to digest all that they see. They cling to each other for comfort and move together like a single wave. When one cries, the others cry too. And when one laughs, the others smile before asking what is amusing. Sometimes I feel like I am one of them. We look after one another and I have taught them all I know. Do not commit adultery, I tell them. Follow the path that is good and right, I say. And when they forget to do their homework, I ask them if they want to be educated ladies or useless tubers with arms and legs. They giggle when I say this. One day, I had a thought and shared it with them. I said it would probably be better for me to hang myself after they marry and leave home. They crumpled into a pile on the floor and wept. Mama, we would never leave you here, they cried. They understood so much more than I ever did. Like I said, they have eyes in their stomachs. Polanley does not deserve the treatment the other wives give her. They bark at her as if she were a child. Don't sit there and don't touch that. All day long they are at it. Yet she does as she is told and never complains. We both do as we are told. One of these days, I should talk to her. I must think of the words that I will say to her. Perhaps it is too early. And the other wives would call me a traitor. They would eat my flesh and wipe the blood from their lips. I think I should watch her a little longer. If fate says we will speak to each other, then one day we will. I have a secret. I have started weeding again. I do it when Baba Segi comes to lie with me. He doesn't like it. He keeps clasping my hands high above my head to stop me. But when he is in the throes of humping, I wiggle one arm out of his grip. I close my eyes and scrape the soil. I push aside the leaves. I prod the stem and pinch the bud. My mind goes to the meat cellar. So I pull slowly, very slowly. Then quite unexpectedly, the plant is uprooted and pulsing at my fingertips. I do not open my eyes. I don't want to see Baba Segi looking at me. Rogue, Bolanli. In the two years I've been living in Babasegi's house, he has never apologized for his mistakes. He makes peace in his own way, and it involves tattered brown envelopes bursting with 50 naira notes thrust beneath doors at dawn. I'd been ruffled by the red thread incident, and I could think of no better way to calm myself than to spend the day at Songo Market. I decided to visit the bric-a-brac stall around lunchtime. My intention was to buy something really ostentatious, like a copper plate. But when I got there, I found neither bell nor bell ringer. You better keep walking, a woman who sat with her back to me warned. The police might be watching from afar to see who comes looking for him. Keep walking. We are talking about stolen property, you know. The woman was unpacking cheap aluminium pans and cutting up cardboard boxes with a giant pair of tailor scissors. She didn't turn round to face me. I wondered if she was addressing someone else. Sorry to disturb you, but I'm looking for the man who sells imported tableware. Move closer to my stall. Didn't you hear me? He has been arrested. Yesterday, a rich man came to buy some plates. When he got to your friend's stall, he immediately called the police. It turns out some of the plates on sale were his very own. Within minutes, your dish seller and his stolen wares were bundled behind the counter at the police station. You mean all the crockery was stolen? But he said they were imported by Italian merchants. Italian merchants! <laughs> the woman burst into laughter. She clutched her enormous breasts before doubling herself over, as if she feared gravity would lug them off her chest. When she sat up straight, there were tears streaming down her face. <laughs> My sister, you make me laugh. Did you expect him to say he got the plates from so-and-so's house? Or maybe you expected him to give you the address they were stolen from? <clears throat> My dear, he confessed within minutes. He didn't even wait for the sergeant's third slap. Sister, the sun is high. Go your way. You are blocking my stall. Unless, of course, you want to buy pots. Mind you, these ones are made in Nigeria. No, thank you. I shuffled along with the ebb of evening buyers. I felt like a stupid fool. But more than that, I felt like an accomplice. I rushed home as soon as I could, wondering what to do with the bulls. Apart from the fact that their splendor now seemed iniquitous. They were evidence, stolen goods, and I knew I had to dispose of them. The bats were on their daily pilgrimage. The sky was awash with them. As a child, I'd always marveled at their fluidity. How, like dirty water, they poured onto the graying sky in organized chaos. A chosen few dropping to the flanks, floating a while before rejoining the rest. Why do bats travel at dusk? I once asked Mama. Because they are witch birds. Witches fly at dusk. This was not a satisfying answer for a nine-year-old. But how can a bat be a witch? Because they hang upside down. 
if you hung upside down, what would happen to you? Would I die? I asked. The good beans dropped through my fingers into the bad beans pile. Of course you would, but they wouldn't. They can sleep upside down because they have evil powers. Stop talking and sort the beans, Bolandi. We have to finish quickly. The landlord's wife wants us to grind them as well. She whispered, it's her husband's birthday party tomorrow. Can we go? I want to see the cake. Lara found a slice in a plastic bag last year. Hmm. Did she eat it? Mama's hand stopped moving and crept to her waist. Her jaw stopped too, which was a bad sign because she never completely swallowed her bitter cola. She always swirled a diminishing nugget around her mouth. No. Yes. I knew I'd said too much. Mama forbade us from scavenging. Will you children never learn? Mama turned to her left and then her right, as if she was addressing an invisible audience. Look at me sitting here sorting beans. Do you think I don't have better things to do? I agreed to pick these stupid beans to secure the roof over your head. So Madame will not tell her husband that I am unhelpful. So her children will not see my children carrying their belongings out on their heads like wretches after they've served us a notice. I know, Mama. She hadn't finished. She tucked her hair into the black hairnet and pulled her right earlobe in my direction to indicate that I should open my ears to their full capacity. I don't want to see you going there begging for food. If your father wants to go there, lick their bottoms and beg for beer, let him. I am not bringing my children up to be beggars. I am working myself to death because I want you and that glutton sister of yours to own houses and cars. I am bringing you up to be able-bodied women who will fight for prosperity and win. No one enjoys success if they do not work hard for it. I hear you, Mama. She still wasn't finished. Will the taste of cake improve your lot in life? Is it nourishing? Mama also asked ridiculous rhetorical questions when she was annoyed. The problem was that they required contrite monosyllabic answers. Mama lifted her hips off the stool. I knew there was more trouble to come from the look on her face. Her features had become pinched and distorted with anger. Let me go and find that Lara. She will hear it from me today. Why must she follow her long throat wherever it beckons? And was she not supposed to help us sort these stupid beans? Where is she now? Lara! Omo Lara! She bellowed. A few moments later, I heard Lara screaming. Mama had yanked her from the mattress she was curled up on, pulling her outside by her ear, all the time slapping her over her head. A slap for every syllable. You are a lazy girl. Who will marry a glutton like you? Why is it always you? Why can't you be like your sister? Through tears, Lara glared at me, her large seven-year-old eyes full of malice. I could only stare back. My eyes were also brimming with tears. Lara did not speak to me for three weeks. When I entered a room, she walked out. When we were forced to sit together, she made sure our legs didn't brush against each other. It took six bowls of akara to appease her. And even then, when I handed them to her, she just wolfed them down without saying so much as thank you. As soon as I got home, I ran to my bedroom and pulled on a pair of worn jeans. I forced my arm under the bed and pulled out an old cardboard box. Then I knelt before my stack of crockery and one by one crushed them against each other. The long honeymoon tried to flee my fingers when I groped under the bed for it. I threw it in the box. I gathered all the mementos I'd kept over the years, the single earring that Chegon, the landlord's son, had given me when I turned 18. Just wear it like a pendant, he said. In went the hairpiece, Babasegi said, looked like a horse's tail. All the love letters I'd written to myself, the sort I'd have liked to receive. I tore up every one and sprinkled the pieces around the box like confetti. When I was finished, I hauled the box onto the top of my head. It was heavier than I thought it would be, but I'd learned to endure that sensation of my neck disappearing into my shoulders. Years before, Lara and I had been forced to fetch buckets of water from a nearby well because the landlord had complained that the human traffic to the borehole on his property unnerved him. When the cold water splashed over our shoulders as we trudged home, we cursed the water corporation that denied us tap water in the first place. I heaved past the other wives in the sitting room. They stared at me and then at one another, in puzzlement. I pretended not to see them and marched ahead to the desolate spot in the backyard where the old drum was. Charred bits of metal and melted plastic that had been pushed into the ground by rainfall protruded from the earth like gravestones. The ground around was scalded, the stones discolored by soot. I eased the cardboard box onto the ground with a clatter and gave the blue keg a generous jiggle. The liquid trickled from paper to pottery and immediately the air around the box distorted the patterns on the crockery. It only took two matches to set the box alight. I stood there and watched the fire cremate my past, even when the heat drew sweat from my face. 
When the fire died, I gathered the scattered shards that remained, dug a hole in the warm soil, and buried them. Back in my bedroom, I surveyed the open spaces that rolled out before me. Now there would be room for a cot, I thought. Iya Segi I was an enormous child. My mother said I made her back curve like a cat's tail. She said she didn't know what to do after my father left her, so she just ate and ate. After I was born, she consoled herself by eating more. She ate and ate, and what she couldn't eat, she rammed into my mouth until I was full, rolling on the floor, beckoning sleep. She said she was forced to wean me because I shamed her in front of her customers by demanding breast milk. Let me suck, I'm hungry, I whined, to the surprise of the old women. My mother sent me to daycare the next day, like every other four-year-old. The food my mother ate seemed to toughen her. Her arms and legs could rival a man's for strength. She said so herself, and she was the only woman who turned fufu and sold it wholesale. My youth was filled with the smell of fermented cassava, my nails brittle from constant immersion in water. I never knew my father. Your father left me for a beautiful woman. I told him I was pregnant, but he didn't want to hear it. He sliced me like okra and left. He pursued another woman's hole and died inside it, my mother said. When she spoke of my father, a small Adam's apple bounced around her neck like an erect nipple under a loose blouse. Men are nothing. They are fools. The penis between their legs is all they are useful for. And even then, if not that women needed their seed for children, it would be better to sit on a finger of green plantain. Listen to my words. Only a foolish woman leans heavily on a man's promises, she said. My mother had a friend who sold dye. We called her Mama Laru. Her fingers were always stained violet, and the soles of her feet were black like burnt rubber. Even though she knew the children were afraid of her, she insisted on stroking the head of every child that greeted her. She was a widow too, and she had just one child, a son called Ishola. Mama Laro and my mother were great friends. Both of them were fat and callous to the eye. When they sat on a bench under the guava tree, it was as if two elephants were swaying on a branch. The children around the village would summon each other just to look at the spectacle. Some of them could not hold their laughter. May that laughter choke you, Mama Laro would curse. By the time I was 18, Ishola, who would be my future husband, had gone to Ibadan to be a bricklayer's apprentice. I had become quite adept at making fufu, and like my mother, I had a stash of money under my mattress. But it was a small mattress, in a small room, in a tiny two-bed house. I troubled Mama about getting my own quarters. I was tired of squeezing past her at every doorway. I have told you before that you cannot buy land and build your own house. The village men will say you are ridiculing them, doing what they can't. But it's just a house, Mama, and they will tear it down and burn it, daughter. My money grew until I had to hide it in old water pots in my room. Every night, I would light my kerosene lamp and sit with my buttocks against the closed door. Even if I had counted the day before, I counted the money all over again. My fingers liked the feel of money. My eyes liked to see the piles of money swell. I worshipped money, even when boys teased me over the flap of flesh that circled my neck. I was not bothered. I looked at them and sniggered, knowing their father's fathers could not have a fraction of the wealth I had accumulated. My mother grew weaker until death shone in her eyes. I could see it without looking. I was 23 and my breasts had bulbed and sagged. It wasn't until the day I went to call the carpenter to repair our bench that I realized there was a whole path in life that I had never trod. The carpenter was about my age, and as I described the extra reinforcement I wanted for our bench, I noticed that he was looking at the buttocks of the tomato seller walking by. As if she knew, she turned to him and smiled. You want it? she asked. Only if you are giving it away for free. <laughs> Nothing in this world is free, let alone a woman. Tell me the price and let me consider it. It is beyond your means. The girl swung her hips like a ripe mango on a tree. I could not stop looking at her. Her walk, her filthy tongue, her short cropped hair, her bare feet. Everything about her fascinated me. I was awash with lust. Lady, <laughs> I cannot afford you, but here is somebody who can, <laughs> the carpenter shouted after her. He was guffawing and his front teeth protruded in my direction. The tomato seller looked at me, kissed her teeth and chuckled. I returned the next day and sat with the carpenter with a list of new furnishings for him to construct. I'd hoped that the tomato seller would hawk through the same route, but she did not return. 
Her brazenness meant she probably wasn't even from our village. I walked home with the new bench balanced on my head, disappointed. I went to bed scattered and perplexed. That night, I did not help my mother put balm on her rheumatism. And when she knocked, I lay still. I couldn't get the girl out of my mind. For comfort, I started to count money. But before long, I was lying dreamily on the bed. There was money everywhere, spread liberally over my thighs, my neck, my upper arms. This is how my mother found me, bathed in money, wearing the notes like a garment, when she barged in at midnight. She was equally alarmed to find me naked but for my pants. My clothes were strewn all over the room. Mama concluded on the spot that the root of my madness was money. You have made money, your husband, she said. From then on, marrying me off became her life's ambition. Child, did you see Baba Olode's son who asked of you when he passed just now? My mother would ask. It was as if she wasn't the same woman who'd said God gave men bollocks for the weight they lacked in brains. I do not want her to die alone like me, I heard my mother saying as she lifted the skin of her thigh to scratch the inside of her knee. She has entered the age of shame, Mama Laro replied in agreement. Money has taken over her senses. She does not even care about bearing children. Did I not warn you? Why would men mean anything to her when she's grown up hearing you rip them to shreds? I just wanted her to know the truth. Ah, ah well, she knows it too well now. Come, my friend, where is your son? Will he not return? Look at me talking about the holes in your roof when mine is leaking. My son is 26. Every time I ask him when I will see my grandchildren, he tells me he has to make the money he will use to feed them first. You mean he has not found a wife after all this time? He says Ibadan doesn't have wifely women anymore, only women who are after money. Then why doesn't he come and take a wife from here, Inomi Adio? You have spoken wise words. We have been friends for a long time. I am dying. Why don't you take my daughter and make her yours? Let me give her to you with my blessing. Let your son take her from me and I will watch over them from the next world. From my bedroom, I heard my mother sobbing, which was strange because the prospect of death did not usually upset her. She said she wanted to go to heaven and kill my father all over again. She must have been desperate for me to be married. Mama Alaro looked at my mother and took a decision there and then. Although she worked as hard as my mother, she was not as wealthy. Whether we accompany our palm oil with yam or we accompany our yam with palm oil, the most important thing is to have a good meal of oil-soaked yam. We must help each other. Even listening in on their plans for me did not take the tomato cellar off my mind. After searching for days, I traced her to the farmland on the edge of our village. When I saw her, courage failed me. My liver weakened and I could not bring myself to talk to her. I abandoned my fufu and stalked her, overjoyed to be breathing the air she was breathing. I saw every man she teased. A gasp escaped my lips every time she rolled her hips and jiggled the beads that adorned her waist. Sweat was dripping from my neck, like rain from the awning. I can't explain why, but I wanted her for myself. I wanted to build a house for her and keep the key between my breasts. I wanted to dress her in the finest ashoki so she could parade herself for my delight alone. I wanted to lock her between my thighs. When I got home that evening, I opened my bedroom door and immediately the shadows cleared from my eyes. My room had been ransacked and all my money was gone. My heart beat so loud that the sound filled my head. I couldn't scream lest demons rush out of the forests, so I opened the door of my bedroom to report the tragedy. Mama was standing there, filling up my doorway. It's all gone, she said. She was standing erect without leaning on the doorpost. I had not seen her like that in two years. I have given it to the man who will be your husband. He will need it to look after you. My husband? Mama, women don't need husbands. I spoke her own words back to her. You do. You need one to bear children. The world has no patience for spinsters. It spits them out. <laughs> is this all so I can bear children? It is every woman's life purpose to bear children. Do you want to become a ghost in the world of the living? That is not how I want to leave you in this world. I did not hold her words against her, but nodded approvingly throughout the wedding festivities. Omi Adio will never be able to boast of a more lavish marriage. My mother and Mama Laru did not hold back in spending money. They bought three cows and eight bags of rice. They invited the chiefs from all the neighboring villages. Come and see the splendor of the woman who was abandoned for mere beauty, my mother said 
as she welcomed guests. I surrendered because I knew it was the prelude to her death. The celebrations were her last dance with the living. She could no longer stand up unaided. And when she sat back to survey the caliber of the wedding guests, each breath sounded like a long drawn out fart. I knew, as many did, that she would soon breathe her last. My new husband observed me with interest, but I looked ahead and turned my ear to him. I could see the tomato seller dancing with the carpenter. A small crowd had gathered around them. The moment of notoriety made the carpenter euphoric. His teeth were high up in the air and he rolled his hips in jerky movements. My husband followed my gaze, perceived my repulsion, and decided it was time for us to get up to thank the guests at each table. Any yawani many? They prayed for a fruitful union. Asheru, he replied, rubbing his palms together and looking at me mischievously, as if to warn me that I would soon bear lashings from his penis. As I prepared to accompany him to Ibadan the following day, I knew he didn't know the source of the money his mother had stuffed into a cash bag. From the way he held his head, it was clear he believed it was a great gift from his mother. On the bus to Ibadan, his arm rested on mine. It was as if someone had placed a twig on my wrist. He was a thin man in those days, so slight that a whirlwind could have swept him away. I looked up at him and found him smiling at me. I smiled back with all my teeth. My weight may have made me the butt of many jokes, but my teeth shone like light through leaves. Later that night, in his one-bedroom hovel in Ibadan, he wriggled between my thighs and marveled at the size of my breasts. He said they would do him for a lifetime. It was my first time, so I hardly heard his words. The pain in my belly spread through my back and up my neck to my ears. That night, I dreamt of the tomato seller. She was sitting on top of a huge tomato shrub, yelling, Where are you, carpenter? The carpenter was hiding behind a tree nearby, pelting her with little red tomatoes. Every time one hit her, it splattered and left a red ring on her skin. When I woke, I told myself that my heart had stopped aching for her and that she could have the carpenter if that was what she wanted. My new husband turned to me. I am pleased you are here with me, if only to fatten me up a little, he said. I will follow you anywhere, my lord. I raised my buttocks and let him fill me again. I would follow my money anywhere. After two years, his business began to flourish and he bought a piece of land. He rallied cheap laborers and our house rose from the ground very quickly. For a time, he seemed happy. I was certain that I satisfied him. <laughs> Men. They always try to swindle you out of what is yours. When he brought home other wives, I did not complain. I did not say a word. I did not even show that I feared for my money. I just kept quiet and watched him. Who can tell what madness makes men go in search of things that puncture their pockets? <coughs> but that was the path he chose, and I accepted it. Women are my husband's weakness. He cannot resist them, especially when they are low and downcast, like puppies prematurely snatched from their mother's breasts. I do not blame the women either. They too are weakened by the prosperity he offers. Besides, apart from that Bolanli, whose nose is so high that it brushes the skies, the other wives do not offend me. They are like humble maidservants who live for a kind pat on the head from the mother of the home. They know that I am the true provider. My husband only thinks he controls this household, and I let him believe that he does. I want him to believe he does. But I am the one who keeps this household together. Good things happen here because I allow them. I alone can approve vengeance, and only I know how to bring calm. As a baby, Segi clung to me as if the spirit had warned that I would one day run away and leave her. She has grown to be a loyal daughter. When I knew the damage that Bolande would do to our home, I warned her. I told her that a girl who abandons her mother's breast for another woman's will be cursed. I told her that she must be my eyes, my ears, my nose and my hands when I am not in this house. She has been faithful. She tells me everything that happens in my absence. I have told her that she must cling to me until the day she leaves to rule her own home. She will not falter. I have trained her well. Akin refused my milk after a year and cried for morsels of food. Rather than be bound to my back, he preferred to walk beside me. All day he sat next to me at my first cement stall. Never did I have to wipe a tear from his kind eyes. He entertained himself, watching me as he fed himself, smiling each time I tucked money into my cash bag. Now I have eight cement shops in Ibadan alone, and my wealth swells by the day. Do not say I am greedy, because I am not. It's just that as my money grows, my path to freedom becomes clearer.
everybody wants to be free from whatever binds them. Baba Segi will breathe his last one day and my money will return to me. I will pile it on top of the money I have now and the heap will be as hefty as the hills of Idori. Then I will leave this city and return to my village. I will buy a big marble headstone for my mother. I will burn down her bungalow and build a four-story building in its place. From the top balcony, I will watch hawkers come and go. I will not let Bolande turn my future upside down.